We're here today. Thank you for bearing with me as I put the batteries in the microphone. We have to have power. Um, I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful week uh, in the Word, time of prayer. Um, I, I, you know, we had a little going back and forth on our WhatsApp post regarding birthdays. There seems to have been a lot of birthdays this last week. If you had a birthday this last week, raise your hand. Who, who had a birthday last week or last two weeks? I know there was Stephen. He's out right now. Um, there were a couple others. But we, yeah, it was kind of a joke back and forth. To which month is better? Because we have a lot of birthdays in June. And we have a lot of birthdays in October. But the real answer is whatever birthday your month is in, right? That's, that's the best month. Uh, no, we're thankful that a birthday is a, sim is a symbol of someone who is created in the image of God. And we get to every time a birthday comes up, just have a, a fun celebration of that. And we love to sing happy birthday and all of those things. But we are created by God, and life is important. We always should remember that, an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let me say again, welcome you to faith. I want to welcome you to Faith Baptist Church. We're going to be introducing some of our visitors a little bit down the road, and we're glad we have some visitors, first-time visitors with us today. You are very welcome. Thank you for being here. Let's all stand, if you would. We're going to start with our music. I'm going to lead out in the first couple of songs. And then I'm going to have our brother Joseph, only has two more Sundays, I think, with us. And I'm very thankful for our college interns, glad they're here to help us in our church. But he's going to come up in a little bit. This is a song we've sung in the past. I hope you all know it. It's called By Our Love. How many of you remember the song, By Our Love? Yes. So if you remember this song, then you know that the men... Did I turn us off here? The men start us out because brothers obviously that's men and then on the second verse we have the sisters come in now if you don't know this song you can kind of listen to everybody else follow along get the words we'll have the words on the powerpoint also the words in your bulletin but let's start with the men help me out here it starts out real low and i think that's why the men are starting because it's a low note that we're starting out on help me out we'll get started sing it out loud think of the words as we sing this song, By Our Love. Brothers, let us come together. Come on, men. In the Spirit, there's much to be done. We will come reaching out from our comfort. Wow, that's great. on the third. Yeah. 
great song. Do they know you by your love? What a question to ask. Great way to start our service. Do we have the love of Jesus Christ within us? And if we do, do other people around us know it? Do other people around us know it? Let's sing the next song, Christ is All I Need. A lot of people think all they need is money. All they need is a nice house. All they need is a nice car. All they need is a job, security. But really, when it comes down to it, Christ is all we need. Let's sing this song together. We'll sing through it twice. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. Christ is all Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. Great singing. You may be seated. Thank you. Again, we want to welcome you to Faith Baptist Church. Um, it is good to have... Brother Amos and Miss Deborah with us. Thank you for being here. And uh, friends of Michael's, and I've heard the names, and it's finally good to put a face. I think we met one other time we had talked about before. And so we're very glad to have you here with us. Um, I don't see anybody else. This is your first time. First time to be here at Faith Baptist Church. I think most, if this is your first time, raise your hand. Because um, after the service... We do have a small time. We want, if this is your first time, we want you to get with our welcome committee and they'll give you more information regarding our church and if you have any questions and we have a special gift for you that we want to give to you saying thank you for being here with us at Faith Baptist Church. Um, our FBC missions partners, we have our highlight focus and I just had a chance to talk to Pastor Yacente. This was on Saturday. Um, we were WhatsApping back and forth. And he mentioned that they really need a printer for their ministry. So I told him I would mention that to you and let's pray about as if God would have them or God for God to provide a printer so they can print out some information and get it out there, the gospel tracts and other areas for that he would use that printer for. So let's continue to pray with them. But he said the ministry is going very well. God is blessing. They're continuing to see souls saved, lives changed. He is in Rwanda. For those of you that have never met the family before, church planting in Rwanda. And if you would like to know more about our FBC mission partners, we do have a blue, um, a blue little sheet here that you can pick up in the back near the offering box. We have a, a kind of a place to put a lot of different uh, these envelopes and information for you. So please pick one up, take it with you. It says, how can on the back, it says, how can you be involved in missions? has three areas. Pray for our mission partners, give support to our mission partners, and then you yourself go spread the truth of God's word to others around you. Three ways that you can be involved in our mission work. And we also have a bulletin board on the outside. As you are coming in, in that entrance, there's a bulletin board. You can go look at our different missions partners and even read some of the letters of what God is doing. Uh, different parts of the world. Here in Uganda, we have Rwanda. We have truth. We have some radio stations that we're also helping. So please gather more of this information. Continue to pray for Pastor Yacente as I pray to open the service that God will work specifically in his ministry and his life and protecting his family. All right? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. We need you, Lord, every moment, every second, every minute, every hour. You are all that we need. We have to trust and rely on you every moment. There's a lot of chaos in the world today. 
you know exactly what's happening in the places th where war, war torn areas, um, people are dying and suffering, but it's happening all over the world and we need, it's desperately we need to get the gospel out to these people who maybe they only have one day left. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen today in our lives. If someone does not know you as their savior here, that they come to know you today so they can spend eternity with you. We just give you all praise. Be with Pastor Yacente as he continues to work in Rwanda. Continue to bless that ministry. Help him as their church grows. Thank you for providing them with a beautiful church building. And thank you for his wonderful family. Be with his wife, uh, Esther, and be with their children. We just thank you for the time and the opportunity we get to pray for them and to give towards their ministry. We love you and we give you all praise in your precious name. Amen. Well, if you can stand with me, and I'm going to have Joseph come up, and he's going to lead us in our next song, It Is Well With My Soul. I hope it is well with your soul this morning. And as we sing, let's mean the words that we'll be singing this morning. Amen. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my love, thou hast done. for singing. We shall be singing our next song, Oh How He Loves You and Me.
Be seated as Pastor Tony comes. Amen. Do you realize Jesus Christ loves you? I hope you have the love of Jesus Christ and it's been shed, shed abroad in your heart as his word says. And we're very thankful for salvation, what that means to each and every one of us. We have our November Bible studies that are coming up. Um, the Spirit's work in the church and that'll be one of them. And we all, there's a lot of talk and and different ideas on what the Spirit, Holy Spirit's work in the church is. How is it manifested within the church? Well, we're going to be talking about that over a period of four weeks, starting next month. And that will be for everyone who wants to attend can come to that. But then for our ladies' class, or, or for ladies, we're going to have something called Choosing Gratitude. Excellent, excellent study. Um, Nancy Lee DeMoss is taken from a book uh, that she has put together and she does a wonderful job at being able to just describe from God's Word. And in this area, this specific one, about choosing gratitude, choosing to be thankful, choosing to be content. And I know, ladies, you'll enjoy this class. And we have some wonderful speakers. I'm going to wait to tell you who those are. Uh, but you'll have some great, great uh, speakers there in that ladies' class. So those are the two different topics we have to choose from for our Bible study in November, which will... Start at 9.30 every morning, every Sunday morning. The next uh, announcement, discipleship groups. If you're interested in discipleship, we're going to be putting a little more emphasis on this uh, in regard to the upcoming year. We'll be telling you more about that. One of the most important things we as believers are to do, and that is to what? Is to study the Word of God, to understand what the Bible says to us, how it applies to us, and how we are to carry out the work mentioned in Scripture. What is God's will? And how does that impact the church? And we want all of the people who are coming to our church, our members, maybe those who are visiting, uh, wanting to know more about our church, to understand what does our church do? What is the purpose of the church? What doctrines do we stand upon based in the Word of God? We believe that the Bible is our sole authority of our faith and our practice. It is the Word of God. Discipleship groups and discipleship time is a great way for us to be able to get that across and through teaching God's Word. So if you are interested in discipleship, you want to be part of a group, come talk to me afterward. Come talk to one of our leaders. We'd be glad to put you into one of those groups that meet after the service on Sundays. Or if you can't say, oh, I just can't meet after the service. My, my food is cooking. I need to get back home. We have lunch coming up. Uh, then we can make a time to meet with you, whether on Zoom, if you have that capability on Internet, or just schedule a time during the week. We would love to get together. If you're a lady, we would have a lady get together with you. If you're a man or if you're a family, then we could have a time we could meet together. So let's focus on that. Next, uh, next announcement is Tuesday Bible study and prayer time. Uh, this is a wonderful time. We had a great time this last Tuesday digging into the Word of God, talking about forgiveness. Uh, interesting topic. This has really been the focus of our last two weeks is the area of forgiveness. And if I were to ask you, you know, how many times in the last two weeks have you been asked or somebody asked you to forgive them? 
Or have you been wronged? And you've need to have, have you needed to have a heart of forgiveness? Wow. Uh, I, I know there's been times even in my life in this last week where I had to go even to my family and ask them to forgive me for a way that I acted that I shouldn't have. Uh, so forgiveness, an important topic, and we're covering this over these two weeks, uh, the last two weeks, Bible study and then in our morning services. So please, if you have an opportunity to come, we'd love to have you here at 530 and then 6 o'clock for our prayer time where we take up our prayer request to the Lord uh, that our church members that you give us to pray for. So that's our Tuesday Bible study and prayer. And then the last Tuesday of the month, which is which day this month? I believe it's the last day. Is it the 31st? Who's up on that on the calendar? Everybody's got to open up their phone and look at the calendar because nobody knows. Uh, 30, I think it's the 31st. Anyway, yeah, I was right. 31st is our Tabernacle Tuesday. That is the time we set up our tent over on our property. And if you're able to come for that, we really start setting up the tent around 4 o'clock. We talk to our neighbors. We encourage them. We pray with them. Uh, we have a good time of just fellowshipping with one another. And then we begin our Bible study and prayer time on our property. So if you come on the 31st for prayer time, you're going to see a note on the gate saying, go that way uh, down to our property if you don't know where that is. So that's our Tabernacle Tuesday. Then Building Fund Sunday, on the last Sunday of every month, we focus on giving towards our building. God has blessed tremendously in that area of giving towards the building. We're just waiting for the approval, the last approval. NEMA, praise the Lord, we announced that has given their approvals for us to begin building. Now we just have our local council approval for the area here. Once we get that, which we hopefully will get that soon, then we'll break ground. What a glorious day that will be. Uh, but the Building Fund Sunday, that is giving towards our building that we'll be building coming up here hopefully soon. And then I think we have one more announcement, and that is ties and offerings. Thank you for those of you who are giving. And I've mentioned this even last week on the back of your bulletin. We have a report of what's been coming in every week, our monthly budget versus tithes and offerings, and then our missions budget and our building fund giving. And let me say, as one of the pastors here, as the assistant pastor, thank you very much for the giving that you're doing. Uh, it's been a blessing to see how God's people have given towards the needs of our church, paying for the rent and paying for utilities. And uh, just thank you for keeping up with the tithes and offerings as God has commanded us to do. And then our missions, we've always been over the amount budgeted for our missions projects and we do have some set aside pastor dan and i will be talking with uh talking with our servant leadership on different projects we can give towards with the extra money we have in our missions project fund and there are some ideas that we have to give towards that so we have the, the brown box we don't pass around a plate if you want to give we have an offering envelope that you can take and designate how you want to give on that envelope well, that is all the announcements. Sorry, went a little long there. If you'll stand, we're going to have a time of welcoming one another. If you see a visitor for the, uh, for the first time, please go shake their hand. Tell them hello. Give them a smile. Say thank you for being here at Faith Baptist Church with us.
It's always a blessing. Wonderful. I see people fellowshipping, smiling, and talking to one another. That's a, a blessing. It's a, it's a happiness to see everyone greeting one another. So we'll stay seated for this song, but we'll stand for the scripture reading. Sorry. All right. So let's remain seated. We shall sing this song. People are enjoying the fellowship. So even the song leader has to wait. No, the song leader doesn't have to wait. He has to keep on going. All right, so our next song will be singing, Take My Life and Let It Be. This should be your prayer. As a Christian, this should be your prayer. Uh, musicians are not there, so we'll be singing a cappella. So let's see how we'll do. But I believe the Holy Spirit is there to help us. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord. To them, take my hands and let them move as the impulse of thy love, as the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing. Always only for my King. Always only for my King. Take and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not one coin will I withhold, not one coin will I will hold. take my will and make it done. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be throne it shall be thy royal throne Amen, wonderful singing and this time I request all of us to stand with our Bibles stand and we have a script this time the book of Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 and if you please if you need to borrow a Bible Brother Brave will come around and give you one. There's only one, not many. People have read. I think the other ones have already been given. So please, if you need to borrow a Bible, Brother Brave is there to help you out. So the book of Galatians chapter 6, again to help you out, Galatians is in the New Testament. Yeah, I always help out. <laughs> All right, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, we'll have a reading at this time. I hope all of us are there. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. Let me call Pastor Tony. Thank you. Let's remain standing for the song, song of the month. And thank you for all of you who are singing this song and have learned this song. Back on right. And if this is a new song to you, then bear, bear with us and listen to the rest of us as we sing our love this song of the month. Yet not, yet not I and you speak, but through who? Through Christ. I think we've kind of, hopefully you've seen a, th a theme throughout
the words as we sing this song together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my only lonely Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can see, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. the third. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price it has been paid. Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. seated. Thank you. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's a great song. You know, we look at all that's going on in the world, the suffering, the violence, difficulties happening in the Middle East right now, maybe difficulties you've passed through this week, trials, stress. I've talked to some of you and just the stress that you had this week. The only way we're going to survive all of that as believers is depending upon Jesus Christ in our lives, letting him lead us and direct us and guide us. 
And I, and I hope you'll do that. I hope this, this song that we have for the song of the month is a blessing, is a blessing to your life. Continue to pray for Pastor Dan and his family. They are traveling back this week. Lord willing, they'll be back with us for next Sunday. Uh, we're excited to see them back and being part of the team again here. And so just pray for them. They're going to be flying into Qatar. Uh, he's put a, a message asking for prayer about that. Uh, if you know what's going on in the Middle East right now, it's pretty tense, everything that's happening. So pray for them as they fly into Qatar and then fly here and into Entebbe. Uh, pray specifically on, on between Tuesday and Thursday because that's going to be the traveling times. It is a long journey. And so pray also for their recovery as they get back here to Uganda and then meet with us on next Sunday. And also, I wanted to just give a quick announcement. Our interns, their last official Sunday is going to be next Sunday. And I know you've been blessed by Brave and Joseph. It's been great to work with them over the last two years. We appreciate their effort, their zeal, their energy. You know, when they're up here leading singing, just have that extra little bit of energy and excitement. And amen. And uh, <laughs> so I... I, I, appreciate, I appreciate their zeal. Pray for them as they go on to continue doing what God's leading them to do. And I know Brave is asking for prayer about what God would have for him uh, as he finishes college and graduates. So we're going to have a special time next week welcoming Pastor Dan and Miss Amy and Eric back. And then also just saying a, a farewell to our interns that have been with us and have been a big blessing to us. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to look in verses 23 through 25 today. We're going to be looking at a story. Of course, a lot of Matthew deals with parables. We have been talking about quite a few stories, going through what Jesus used and these stories for, and teaching the people that he was talking to, getting his points across to be a blessing, to be instructive. And so... We're going to continue with that today, and we had a theme last week, it was on forgiveness. Forgiveness. How many times should we forgive someone who does wrong to us? And Peter got the rude awakening, you know, he was thinking, as we had mentioned three, you know, which is what the, the Jewish literature had mentioned, and I'm sure Peter had read that Jewish literature, the Torah and the Talmud and those, those different books they were trained on when they were very young, but he said three. Well, what about the number of perfection? Peter threw out the number seven. Okay, should we go farther than three and forgive somebody seven times? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, no, I'm telling you 70 times seven. Which, in essence, he was telling the disciples and telling those who were listening what was, to their minds, impossible. That means it's continually, it doesn't end, the forgiveness that is given. And we go on today dealing with a story that Jesus gives in relation to this area of forgiveness. What forgiveness has to do with this story. And we go back to the, the, East, the Middle East or the, the Eastern uh, way of thinking, talking about a king in this passage. And what a king is going to be doing this saga, explained by Jesus, details what it will be like in the kingdom of heaven where the Messiah is ruling and reigning. And, and in the kingdom, we'll understand this, in the future kingdom that is to come, which Matthew deals with the kingdom, specifically for the Jews. Matthew was written to the Jews, even though we make application, obviously, for you and I today, right? All the Bible is given to us to make that application, and we can get application, but specifically and in context, the kingdom is mentioned more times in Matthew than it is in any other of the Gospels. For the specific reason that the Jews understood they were going to bring in a Messiah. A Messiah who was going to lead them out of the oppression of the Roman Empire. And set up a kingdom, a literal kingdom on earth, where that Messiah would rule and reign with the Jews forever. Now the Jews, unfortunately, rejected their Messiah. And from the foundation of the world, there was a, a plan that had been put in place. And we see this in the book of John, John chapter 1. There was a plan that had been put in place for Jesus to come to earth to be the, the lamb that was slain, that would be slain, this perfect spotless lamb that was to be slain 
for you and for me so that we could have a way of salvation. But here we're talking about a kingdom, a kingdom that in the future will, I believe, will come according as we see in Scripture. For the Jews, and Jesus will set up this kingdom. He will come again, set up his kingdom, literally rule and reign on this earth. And he's mentioning, okay, what, what is going to take place? How is this going to look in the area of forgiveness at this time? If you're there in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35, we're, we're just going to look through this. We're going to talk through this story and uh, kind of give you some points from it that I believe will be a help to you in this area of forgiveness. We're going to go back, you know, several thousand years, a couple thousand years, and describe what would it have been like when, this, when Jesus was telling this story and, and, and how, it would have perceived, how it would have been perceived with the people there. Before I do that, let, let, me, let me go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord for help as we talk about this story in this passage. Father, we thank you for each and every person that is here today. Lord, I know you have a message for everyone who has come. Your word does not return void. And as we continue speaking on forgiveness, what this means to each and every one of our lives, we heard last week how we, it, it's unlimited, how we are to forgive those who come to us and ask truly for forgiveness. We are not to hold that within our heart an offense, or we are not to gain bitterness in our own life. We are to, to trust in you. We are to be willing and ready to forgive those who come to us and ask for forgiveness. We thank you for your forgiveness in our lives. When we, I know when I was nine years old, Father, and I came and I asked you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and my life and to save me. And you did. And I praise you for that. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's never asked you to forgive them of their sins and to save them, that they'll do that today. We love you. We praise you in your precious name. Amen. In this story, we're going to see, first of all, we're going to see the reckoning. The reckoning. Starting in verse 23, it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. Which would take account of his servants. So number one, let me back up. Number one, we're dealing with wages. What is taking place here? Now, you have to understand, we're in a, let, let me paint a quick picture for you. The king obviously the leader of his empire, has access to all the wealth. He's in control. He's in charge. Uh, it's not a democracy. Uh, this is what he says goes. And so in this passage, in the story Jesus is saying, or telling, describing, he's saying there's a king that is taking a reckoning. He's going around looking in his books and seeing all his servants, and there were servants that had made a lot of money. You can look at yeah, I guess we can equate, if I can equate servants in this time period to civil servants, you would talk about civil servants today. One who are helping out in the government to make things continue to work out for the king. So there are different levels of servants. There are some who have made a lot of money, and there are some who are making a little bit of money. But the king has now opened the books up, or had his accountants open the books up, and see who has been paying the taxes, who has not been paying their taxes. I know when I say the word taxes, it kind of makes people cringe, you know, today. You have these high, if, you're, if you have a business, the taxes that are out there, 30, 35%, you know, and even in America where we are from, the taxes continually continue to raise. And I think when I was younger, they told us uh, when it comes to the working class that you have to work at least three and a half to four months. All your salary for three and a half to four months in America goes towards your taxes for the year. Now, when you look at it that way, it's like, ah, four months of taxes. <laughs> All that money's gone <laughs> to the government for that year. But it's something that's mandatory. We have to pay it if, if you're working and you have the, we have with Social Security and federal and all of that. But here you have taxes you have to pay. In this time, the king demanded taxes from his subjects. So he's opening the book. He's going through. There's a time of reckoning. Well, he gets to one of his servants that are in a higher position of power and finds out, wow, this man owes a tremendous amount of money to me. We can't have this. If I have somebody in this level of power in my, in my, uh, in my kingdom not paying his taxes, what message is that sending to the rest of my kingdom? So the king decides to bring this man 
to stand before him. Let's look and see what the Bible says. It says, And when he had begun to reckon, verse 24, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay his Lord, commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment, payment to be made. Now this is why I put that word fear. You can imagine standing before whoever, you're, the, the magistrate, and you're demanded to pay taxes. And this happened quite a bit in this time period, even in the time of Christ. So the people would have understood this very well. Is that if the Roman Empire, they didn't get their tax that they demanded from the people, the Jewish people, they would take the family as slaves. They would take the daughters, sons, and make them, turn them into slaves until they paid back the debt. But the number here is very interesting. 10,000 talents. If we were to break that down um, and, and make it, one talent was worth 30 kilograms of, say, of a metal, silver. And that was one talent, which if you look at that much money at that time, 30 kilograms of silver, that would be like a year, a year's wage for one servant. Times that by 10,000. You get the picture. It was an impossible amount to pay back. There's no way this man was going to be able to pay back. But yet, what did, the, what did the servant do? He began to plead. So we have the reckoning that took place. There was irresponsible activity. Now, if I can back up just a second. We, if you look at the servant, the servant was obviously irresponsible because he didn't pay. He was either irresponsible or, which I believe, he was more divisive trying to find a way around not having to pay taxes. Not talking about a loophole here. We like the word loophole in our tax uh, dealings. Uh, trying to find ways that not we deceive the government, but we can still be honest citizens and not pay as much as we should. This man was not like that. He was working his way around the system and deceiving the government so he would not have to pay taxes. So he was irresponsible. And then not only was he irresponsible, but he got to a point where he was disrespectful. He did not care that his master forgave him. We're going to see that a little bit down the road. But what was the response of this servant? What did he do? Like any one of us would have done. What would you do if you were told that, hey, I'm going to sell your family. I'm going to take you into, into slavery. You're going to have to go to the tormentors or not even, he didn't even mention tormentors here. We'll see that down the road. But you're going to have to go to prison, debtor's prison, until you pay back. What would you do? I would plead for mercy. <laughs> I, would, I would say, you know, sir, king, uh, lord, whatever they called at that time, please forgive me. Uh, help, you know, show mercy on me. I'll work as hard as I can to pay back this debt. And I, show, I just let you know that there's, there was no way this man was going to pay back 10,000 talents, no matter how long he worked. But he was pleading, saying, please, king, let me try to work it off. Now, what did the king do? Secondly, we see a willingness. There were the wages, and then there was the willingness. Go to verse 25. It says, But for as much as he had not to pay his Lord, the Lord commanded him to be sold. Verse 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. The willingness to forgive. As I look at my own life, or maybe you look at your own life, we understand what we were like before salvation, if you are saved. You realize the deadness, if I talk about it in theological aspect, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had a tremendous debt. And there was only one person that could pay that debt. And that was Jesus Christ. The willingness that Jesus showed to die on the cross so that we could have a way for this debt that we would never know, no matter how long we work, which sadly there are people who are working today to try to pay off that debt without asking for forgiveness. There are people who are saying, if I do enough good works, 
and I put that on the scale when I get to heaven, they're going to outweigh my bad works that God will accept me, but the Bible is very much against that teaching. We know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that there's, no, there's, no enough, there's not enough amount of work we can do to pay off a debt. It was like this servant who was getting on his knees pleading the king to forgive him of his debt. You know, without Jesus Christ, where is our eternity? Where will we spend our eternity? Without Jesus Christ, the Bible says there is a place that was created for Satan and his angels called hell. A place that anyone who does not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior or has their debt paid for, they will spend eternity. We don't want anyone. That's why we give the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want anyone to have to spend an eternity in hell. This is why we go out during the Martyr's Day festivities and we hand out pamphlets to people. Those that have walked showing they, their good works trying to get the favor of God by walking from a distance of South Sudan coming. And I, it was neat to talk to so many people just getting their stories of, of how far they had come and how long they had walked. And I asked them, why? Why did you do this? Why did you make this long journey and suffer in this great way? Many people, their legs were swollen. They they're, they're, didn't have enough water to drink many times. The people did help them when they came in. But they went through a tremendous amount of stress coming from their home to worship. Sometimes the martyrs, some people were coming to worship. They said God, but they were doing it to gain favor by what their works were, what they were doing, instead of getting down on their face and saying, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of that, that tremendous debt that I will never be able to pay myself. It only can be paid through the, the bought blood of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for me. So we see here this servant on his knees begging and pleading for forgiveness. And then the king willingly, which is a great depiction of what God does for us when we get on our face and on our knees before God. He willingly forgave the servant. He was released. It was a, and in this case, because we're going to see what happens next, it was a conditional pardon. It was saying, now I've given you forgiveness because I've given you forgiveness. If you truly understand this forgiveness that I've given you, you go forgive others. You go forgive others their trespasses. So in understanding the willingness, we see the release. We see the reason. Forgiveness was requested. Mercy is shown. How many times in our lives has God shown mercy upon us? Has God given mercy to us? Um, my, heart is, my heart is broken uh, over watching the, the clips that I've watched over the, the war that's going on in Israel and Palestine and, and all the, the people that have been caught up in the middle. Wherever you stand on the issue, um, we still realize, and I, I was talking yesterday when I was at a market area uh, with my wife and Lexi, and I was talking to a UN worker and who's involved heavily with all that's going on, has been involved with refugees here. And he just, he was shaking his head, just saying how many people are caught up in the middle of all this, how many lives are being lost, how many children, how many babies have been killed, how many ladies, women have been slaughtered. It's just, it's, it's a horrible, horrible situation that's going on. In the midst of all of the tragedy that's taking place, there are glimpses of how God has spared some lives and those lives as we've heard testimony have come to Jesus Christ through it it's exciting to hear some of that taking place the mercy of God now I'm not please don't misunderstand me I'm not blaming God and I know some people have said why would God allow this to take place this is not God that opened the 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 Pandora's box, if I can put it that way, of all that's taken place. It is sin. It is evil. It is wickedness in the heart of man that has opened this 
whatever you want to call it that's taking place in the Middle East right now, a, a, a fire that has just consumed so much. But yet God in His mercy, we have seen that throughout. We have seen God show mercy in our lives. And how often do we take note of it and realize just by me being able to breathe today is through the mercy of God, through His goodness to us, and that He has forgiven us. His mercy, His willingness to forgive. We see the king has now forgiven this servant. Now, how has the servant, what has he done now? Has he taken the forgiveness and applied it to his heart? Has he understood what it means? Mm. Jesus goes on. Look at the next verse here. After the servant was forgiven this tremendous debt, in fact, one that was impossible to pay, it says, Then the Lord of the, that servant was moved with compassion, verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Pay me that thou owest. What, a, what an incredible sign of disrespect to the king that had just forgiven him all. Now there's a man who owes him pretty much a week's wage. And yet the man's asking him, please forgive me. Now, did the, did the servant who caught the man up and said, pay me what you owe me, was he right in doing that? Sure. That was what the money that was owed him. And the servant who owed him the money was obligated to pay him back. But with what that servant who had just been forgiven so much had just witnessed and been part of, should not that have affected his life that when the, the servant, lesser servant, came to him and asked for forgiveness, that he should, have, he should have forgiven. He should have said, no, look at what just happened to me. I was just forgiven everything, a lot more than what you're asking of me, but what did he do? I believe because the servant had a wicked heart and Jesus was showing this, he grabbed this man by the neck and he did not just tell him or throw him in prison and say, okay, you're going to sit here in prison until you pay me back. What does the Bible say? There was an interesting word. The Bible says he sent this man to the tormentors. He actually was having this man tortured until this man would pay back what he owes. There was a warning. And there's a warning that Jesus is giving here in the story we're going to get to in a moment. But I wanted to focus on how Jesus is pointing out forgiveness has been given. But how has that forgiveness been applied? Has the, the servant who was forgiven much, has he truly understood the forgiveness and taken it to his heart? Because all the other servants that were around, there were probably many servants that were around that witnessed the king forgiving the servant all that he was supposed to be forgiven. And they, they probably were watching very closely. And the Bible tells us in the story that they were watching closely because what did they do when this servant took the other servant by the neck and, and was squeezing him in the neck, basically wanting to kill him, threw him in prison, took his family to be slaves until the debt was paid. Let's look and see what happens next. After 20, verse 29, the fellow servant falling down at his feet and saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The other servant said, the Bible says, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay his debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. There were others that were watching, others that were seeing what was going to take place. You know, in our lives as Christians, there are a lot of people who are watching how we react to those around us, how we respond when we are taken advantage of. And when the Holy Spirit, and I'm not, this is not an illustration saying that we have to let everyone be free if they owe us money, okay? That's not what, that's not the principle being applied here. But if the Holy Spirit works in your heart and you have a, a, a desire, you know, through the Holy Spirit to forgive someone, you, you can give that forgiveness. Because when we look at what God has forgiven us, how much he has given to us, how much we are blessed, we should be willing to have that heart of forgiveness. Not just monetarily, as is mentioned here, but in a 
fellowship relationship sense, as was mentioned in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 and on. We should be ready and willing to forgive. This man was malicious. He was malicious in his action. Why? Because he had an unforgiving heart. He had an unforgiving heart. He was not understanding forgiveness. There, henceforth, he was not willing and ready to forgive. The question I have for you this morning is that do you have a forgiving heart? To have a forgiving heart, you have to know the forgiver. You have to know who the one is that forgave you. You have to understand what that means to you. Because without understanding who God is in you, we've talked about the Holy Spirit in Bible study, without understanding who you have living within you, it will be impossible for you to understand how you can forgive others, their trespasses against you. How you can forgive others, their debt that has maybe been worked up for quite a long time against you. An unforgiving spirit. We need to make sure that our hearts are ready to forgive and that we realize as Jesus Christ is in us, we have that same forgiving heart. And then not only is there an unforgiving heart, but there's an ultimate hate. How much do you have to hate somebody? And we've seen a lot of hate in the last couple of weeks. Plastered if you watch TV and on YouTube and, you know, clips and all that. You've seen a lot of hate. But how much do you have to hate somebody when they owe you a week's wage to take them and to throw them into prison, to take their entire family and to sell them off to pay off the debt. That's a lot of hate. Can we truly have the love of Jesus Christ in our heart when exhibiting that much hate to somebody else? I, people could argue it's possible, but I would argue it's improbable. Because when we have the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts, we want to share and show that love to others. And use the example that Christ gave to us as an example to give to other people's lives. But this man, this servant, had none of that. He was not forgiving. He was hateful. But yet he was forgiven much. How many people have rejected Jesus Christ? They've been offered salvation. They've been offered forgiveness. And yet they say, no, I don't want to have any part of it. I, I, I don't want to have what you're offering to me in eternal life, which is amazing to me. And I can only understand that somebody rejecting the gospel of eternal life and forever in heaven because they've either been blinded by Satan or they're just the evilness in their heart is corrupt and they see other things as better than, say, an eternal life in heaven. Or they don't believe it at all. Ultimate hate. So maliciousness and then meaning this true heart is being revealed. True heart is being revealed. If you go to verse 31, it says, So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord. Wow. You know what's coming. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. Now we see torture again taking place till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now the Lord has heard about it, the king. The time for justice has come, and justice was given. There was a payment for that unforgiveness. Now in verse 35, as we finish up, it says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Wow. That's a strong statement. Think about that for a moment. If you're not willing, if you're not going to forgive someone their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Now, we have to be careful here. Let me, let me put on a pause in this process of what you're thinking through. Because as we realize and we understand in Christianity, the book of Matthew chapter 12 talks about the unpardonable sin. There's only one sin. 
that we realize in Scripture that cannot be or that will not be forgiven. Do you know what that one sin is? Okay, if you've read Matthew 12, you understand it's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So I want to be careful here that we don't misinterpret or misunderstand what this passage is talking about. Remember, there is a dual, there's a dual purpose in what Jesus is mentioning here. There's talk about a future kingdom that is going to be set up on earth. This is him coming and ruling and reigning as Messiah on earth, literally. And he's mentioning the aspects of what's going to take place. Now, we gain application regarding forgiveness and the importance of what Jesus has done for you and for me and how that is to flow out of our hearts to others. But in this economy, when Jesus will come back and rule and reign as Messiah, there is going to be set up an understanding that when you are forgiven, you will forgive. Because if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. I'm thankful that we live in the church age today. And I'm thankful that when we ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives, you ask Jesus Christ to come into your, your life, you are forgiven once and for all. The Bible says in John chapter 10, no man is able to pluck you out of the hand of God. And so we realize that no matter what sin we commit, except for the unpardonable sin, let me, let me back up, but I believe that's, with somebody who truly has never been saved to begin with. But no matter what sin we commit, we are still in the hand of God. We can't lose that salvation. Does that mean we'll continue to live in sin? Romans 6, God forbid. How shall we continue to live in sin that grace may abound? No. We continue following Christ and we live for Him. But in this area of forgiveness, our hearts are knit with Christ because we are saved through faith because, Galatians 2.20, Christ is living within us so that we will forgive others. As we see in closing here, we see a story Jesus is giving about a servant who has been forgiven much but is not willing to forgive little. Who has been forgiven much but is not willing to forgive little. We move forward to our church age today we have been forgiven much. Have you been asked, have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Understanding the debt that he's paid for you. And going a step further, if you know Jesus Christ and your debt has been paid, are you willing to forgive those around you that have trespassed against you? That has been the theme really throughout Matthew 18. And we should be willing to do it no matter how many times somebody comes to ask us to forgive them. A difficult ending to this story. Because as I studied it, I was trying really hard to understand how does this fit? That if I don't forgive, God's not going to forgive me. And what I, as I was studying and as I was asking the Lord to give direction and looking at other passages in Scripture, I began to realize this one thing. And it took me back to the book of Psalms. David mentioned something that the Holy Spirit brought to my mind. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what does it say? The Lord will not hear me. The Lord will not hear me. And as I compared to this passage, the ending here, even though I understand in context, it's talking about a future kingdom, and he's giving a story of, of a future kingdom that is to come. I realized that even as a Christian, if I have sin, it's sin for me not being willing to forgive, if I hold bitterness and anger in my heart, that's sin, right? I'm not willing to forgive someone else. So if I have iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me when I ask Him or when I talk to Him and I ask Him to forgive me when I have trespassed against Him or I've trespassed against others. And that was how, I, as, as I looked at that, I was like, wow. I can make that application for us today in our lives and realize when somebody comes to me and says, please forgive me, and yeah, it's hurt. It's been wrong. I say, with God's grace, I will not hold that offense against you. I forgive you. But yet, if I hold bitterness and I'm angry and I say, no way, I'm never going to forgive you. I'm, you're, you're a brother in Christ. I'm not going to forgive you. 
then that means I'm holding iniquity in my heart. And when I go to Christ and ask him, and I've failed, and I say, Lord, forgive me for something different, he's not going to hear me. How is your heart today? How is your relationship with the Lord? Are you saved? How is your fellowship with your brother or sister in Christ? Have you forgiven? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your love. I ask that you'll work in hearts tonight, today. I ask that you'll